your way. This morning's shir, as we open a new season of studying together, Sefer Malachim uh, Aleph, uh, has to start with a bit of a review, because our last shir was a long time ago, and in fact, today's shir is uh, an expansion upon the shir that I gave last a uh, number of uh, weeks ago, quite a number of weeks ago, in fact, so that uh, we actually need to learn it again, because who's going to remember what we had recently talked about? Let me give you the review. I'm going to ask as uh, the ground rules for our shear. You got to let me talk at the beginnings to present things, present the ideas for the day. Of course, I'm interested in questions and comments, but I ask you uh, for your uh, indulgence, please, uh, to get the uh, get things off the ground. And also to ask yourself before you ask a question, is this germane to our topic of our peric, not what was in five other shiurim ago and what I remember from another course and what have you, if it's germane, by all means. Um, and I'm going to leave it to your discretion to figure out what's germane and what's not, uh, but want to stay focused a little bit on the uh, on the safer so we could uh, learn ahead. So I'm here with a few people in person. We got uh, others on the phone here uh, on Zoom. So uh, so be it. Okay. Lots of room for people to sit here too. So we're up to chapter 13. Malachim Alf, Sefer, Perak, Yud Gimel. And I'm glad that the cat has just crossed across the, uh, the screen over there on your screen, Karen, because uh, we're going to deal with animals today and uh, felines at that. Uh, we'll be there shortly. So Sefer Malachim Aleph, which we've been studying for a little while, but for those who perhaps need a bit of a refresher, uh, is about the first politics of the Jewish people. Uh, um, it's a continuation of Sefer Shmuel, which is the first politics, but I refer to as the first, because the first commonwealth of the Jewish people. And whereas we had a King Shaul, and he was appointed by a Navi, and then he was essentially, lo he lost his, um, his royal charter, and it was given to David HaMelech, which takes us through all of Sefer Shmuel. Uh, when we get to Sefer Malachim, we have the transition, not smooth transition, from David to Shlomo, and I spoke about that a little bit on Yom Tov, on the last day of Yom Tov and Shemini Atzeret, about that transition of uh, Misha, Anna, Ledavid, Ushlomo, Benovi, Rushalayim, Huya Anenu, that it's a father-son transition, but it wasn't so smooth. And the idea that this, that Shlomo Melech vindicates the legacy of his father posthumously, etc. What happens next, though, and for the rest of the book, after the passing of Shlomo HaMelech, and we talked a lot about that. We spent a year pretty much talking about Shlomo HaMelech um, as a, 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 an important, uh, let's call him, biblical figure, a melech, uh, a, a, a author, uh, three svarim in Tanakh, ascribed to him of his own authorship. Uh, when he passes away, his son Rechav Am takes over. And it would seem on the face of it to be a normal uh, transfer of power. They don't seem to be challengers at that time, except except for what happens next that will impact the rest of Jewish history, really the rest of Jewish history. And that is the split between the two tribes who remain uh, the loyalists to uh, the Malchut Yehuda, who becomes known as the, the kingdom of Judea, and the vast majority of the kings, the, of, of the tribes rather, following another person, Yeravam ben Nevat. The challenge is that Yeravam ben Nevat himself has a diploma on the wall. He has a royal charter that comes to him from the Mesora. He might have had his own ideas about uh, wanting to make a power grab, but he actually gets the license and the sanction of a great Navi, Achia Hashiloni, who is the Rebbe of Eliyahu Hanavi. We talked about when we learned that chapter. We're not going back there again. We learned already about the secession of the 10 tribes from the 12 tribes to make their own kingdom and to realize that that split we never recovered from. Everybody knows the lost tribes of Israel. That refers to the lost 10 tribes who centuries later, in the, uh, the near conquest of the entire Holy Land, by the Assyrian Empire. They don't get the whole Holy Land, but they get a lot of it. The Assyrian Empire takes away 10 tribes. Those are the lost tribes of Israel. A big machloket, a big argument. Did they ever come back? Did they return? Did they not return? But that's a split we never really got back from. By the time the Jewish people come back after that first exile, what happens? They're centered around Judea. The province is called Medinat Yehud. You hear the word Yehuda, Yehud. The name was really given to them by the Persians who allowed them to come back in the 6th century BCE. 
uh, 70 years after the exile. They're permitted to come back. And they're centered around Judea. We never hear about anymore about like this tribe, that tribe. And, and that's why we have today the three tribes in quotation marks, Kohen, Levi, Yisrael. Yisrael is really whatever tribe you are, most likely Yehuda or Binyamin, the two tribes that remained loyalists, so to speak, to the kingdom of Judea. What happens though, in the wake of the reality that Yeravam ben Nevat who becomes the king. Remember, he's hiding in Egypt. We saw we saw that whole story. He was hiding in, out in Egypt. That uh, the reason, the, uh, the proximal reason for the split between the 10 tribes and the two tribes is taxation. That's really what it is. Shlomo HaMelech had a very powerful kingdom. We spoke about that extensively. You can find all the videos on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts or what have you, because uh, it's also an audio uh, form without the video. So Shlomo HaMelech is a, a powerhouse economically, militarily, politically, and most important of all, I've argued over and over again, intellectually. The Jewish people export their wisdom by having people come to learn the wisdom of Shlomo, right? Imagine this little tiny area in the world that is exporting its technologies to the whole world because one of the best things that it has is it has the smarts, right? But we, we didn't get it just because uh, uh, we ate our Wheaties. It's part of our culture. And I look heavenward first uh, and foremost because Mina uh, Shemayim, you know, that uh, the, little, the, little, the little place becomes this massive empire. And that was the time of Shlomo Melech, but it turns out it came at a cost. And the cost had to do with the way that people were taxed financially and also in terms of being pressed into national service. When Rechavam, the son of Shlomo, is to take the throne, the people ask him, will you be like your father? And he basically says, I'm going to be way, way st stronger and way harsher with you. And that that it's all about the taxation where a tax collector is killed. You remember that story? We learned about that. And Yeruvah Menevat comes back and he gets this charge. Basically, uh, it's in, in, the, in the Bible. The, the Navi tells us and he gets this charge, Achiyashul, and he tells him, you're going to have 10 tribes. Now, it doesn't say forever. It doesn't say you should do everything that a state would do and make yourself also the great religious leader. And that we spent a lot of time discussing. Uh, also, again, just as the recap, the first uh, 10, 15 minutes for the whole season, for people who might have missed earlier seasons uh, of, of, of this uh, shear. And that is that Yeruvim ben Nevat realizes strategically, that a lot of the legacy of the Jewish people is bound up with Yerushalayim, that there is a three-time-a-year pilgrimage to Yerushalayim, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, the three pilgrimage festivals. But if the Jewish people who now are under his rulership are going to keep going three times a year back to Yerushalayim, to uh, offer korbanot, have their festive meals, the whole jamboree is happening every three times a year, that's in the other kingdom. So they can't go back there over and over again because it's only a matter of time before they realize, well, Rechav Am and the line of the Davidic line, David, Shlomo, Rechav Am, not so bad. Let's, we should really go back. It was a mistake. He can't allow that. So what does he do? He makes separate worship centers. I said it tongue in cheek before, he makes a breakaway shul. He can't, they can't go there, and we can't let them go there. Now, when he does that, the question is, what does he build? A shul? No, no, he builds altars. And what does he build near the altars? Two golden calves. We spent several sessions, so we're not going to unpack that today, but I'll give you the sort of the... There are two views about whether those golden calves were the objects of worship and these people became idolaters. We're talking about 10 tribes of Israel. Or if they had some, it had some symbolic import, some national import um, that uh, was why they were made as calves, because you didn't have to be a big scholar to know about the sin of the golden calf. Anybody knew about the Ego, the sin of the golden calf. What happens? He makes two golden calves, one in the center of his, uh, excuse me, toward the south of his uh, kingdom and one to the north. So one is in Beit El, same area of Beit El today, approximately, in the Shomron. And the other one is up north in Dan. Um, near near the uh, near the banyas, so in that area. So those two, they sort of they're the the the, per, the I don't know the brackets, they're the the bookends. I think I call them. Um, he makes not only this new, these two new worship centers, 
Again, according to some, he's an idolater and he caused the Jewish people to fall into the most base forms of idolatry because once he opened that door, there was only a matter of time before all the rest of the culture from the ancient Near East would pour back in, right? Others say, no, uh, he was still offering the offerings to God, but he had this altar and uh, he put these symbolic uh, objects. And of course, if you were in the per process of writing op-eds or blog posts, so to speak, against Yeravam ben Nevat, it wouldn't be too hard, even if you held it was nothing more than symbolic, et cetera, to say, and look at your golden calves, you are engaged in the sin of the golden calf or calves, because there were two now, one, in, one in, this, in each place, right? It wouldn't be a far stretch to use it, if you will, for its rhetorical power as a, as a point of censor against him. Now, what we'll learn today is the story of what happened on the first festival of Yeravim ben Nevat. And mark this, he made a new holiday. But when you make a new holiday, he made it up, he cooked it up. He was Bodet Milibo. We learned about that in depth at the end of chapter 12. If you're using the Koran Tanakh, by the way, I'm in Malachim Aleph, Perek, Yud Gimel. We're about to start again. It's page 423 in this edition of the Koran Tanakh. If you have another Tanakh at home, or if you want to go online right now to sepharia.org, uh, you can look it up, you know, Bible, Prophets, uh, Kings, Malachim, 1, Kings 1, uh, chapter 13. But at the end of chapter 12, he makes a new holiday. He calls it holiday. It's a great name, Chag. But he makes the holiday specifically. He, can't, he realized he can't make it up out of whole cloth, so he patterns it after another holiday. And when does he do it? He does it in our month, in the month of Marcheshvan. We are coming to the 15th of Mar Cheshvan. And when we get there, we will be exactly one month away from what holiday of the 15th of Tishrei? Sukkot. In the Torah, Sukkot is almost not called Sukkot. In one place it's called Chag Sukkot, but it's also called Chag. Festival. Pesach has its name, Chag HaMatzot, right? Uh, Shavuot, may or may not have its own name, Chag Bikurim, etc. It has all these names, all these festivals have names, they have rabbinic names popular names but what's the what's the word in the torah so it is called in one place chag sukkot but elsewhere in the torah it's called chag so he makes this holiday yeravan ben Nevat makes this holiday instead of the seventh biblical month tishrei he puts it a month later in the, the in the time period of mar Chashva. why does he do that the people remember oh we had that holiday when we used to go to shul over there it's not so far off so you say to me were there no rabbis there was no one there who could figure out um that this was made up, et cetera. Ah, but he, Davka, made it exactly one month after the actual holiday because when you're the king and you have some kind of judiciary, the judiciary decides how the calendar works. And therefore, you could add a, an extra month and push it off. Did they think it was the eighth month or did they think it was the seventh month in their iteration? You understand? You could just play with the calendar a little bit and we, we push things along. Right. So um, uh, this is, of course, a pattern that would repeat later on in Jewish history many times where, uh, let's say, daughter religions of Judaism in order to gain legitimacy and quickly so and be able to uh, bring in adherents and converts. They want to make sure that their new religion is patterned after the old one. And they keep claiming it's not new. It's just a continuation. It's bigger and better. It's 2.0. But it's really the same thing. Look at this. Now, I don't want to go down the road of trying to plug that in too much, but just you'll, you'll, you'll think for yourself what that means. But back to our story, Yeravim ben Nevat, chapter 13. It's the chapter 13 here, again, page of, of Kings 1. So you can look it up online or whatever you have a Tanakh. He is actually gathering the people together. And when he gathers the people together, he himself run this inaugural festival. He runs it by personally going up onto the altar. Now, I'll remind you, he has a diploma behind him on the wall, the royal charter, signed by Achia Shiloni. Signed by the prophet of the generation. The challenge is, how far does that charter go? Can he do whatever he wants? Can he become, you know, I'm saying it advisedly, just so you'll, you'll sort of, you know, get it. He made himself 
the head of the church of Israel. Lahavdal. There's a British king who did that. Lahavdal, another religion. Yeah. Later on, history, Middle Ages. So it's kind of shocking. Kind of shocking. He's standing up on the on the altar, and he's the one, you know, giving uh, korbanot. Um, I see here in the chat. Let me I'll, let me pause you for a couple of questions and comments before we actually start the psukim. This was all the review. I hope it was helpful. So now you understand what's going on in this scene as we're we're opening up chapter thirteen. Um, uh, uh, Lori had written in. What about Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur? Wouldn't that tell them the time of year? Right. So. Don't forget that unlike Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, which are pilgrimage festivals, we have to get up and they have to go somewhere. Even in the olden days, there were many people, no doubt, who came for the Yom Noraim to uh, 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 Yerushalayim, but it was many, many, many fewer people. It wasn't a pilgrimage festival. So on your Rosh Hashanah, if you lived somewhere out in the sticks, of course there was a service going on in Yerushalayim, but if you lived out in the sticks, I mean, somewhere like far away and you have to come by foot, Right down to Shalayim, you'll hear the shofar in your house. Yeah, you'll, you'll daven at home, uh, whatever you're davening. You'll eat your meal. Yom Kippurim is a fast day. Are there amazing things happening in Shalayim? Yes, but the people don't have to be there. So, wouldn't it have, however, told them the time of year? Yes, it would. It would, but and we don't have a record of it. Um, did Yeravan Benavat actually change the whole calendar? Literally, and he told the people Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is a month later this this time. We don't know. We just I don't know. I don't have. I don't remember have finding anything in the works of uh, you know Chazal and Medrashim and Gemaras, etc. I don't. I don't remember that. But it's possible, or or it, it's possible that he just made this festival a month later because he told them, well, you're not going to go to Yerushalayim, so that one you're not going to do. But that one I'm changing. I'm making later. And if you'll say to me, well, how could he do that? They would realize the Taurus is Rosh Hashanah, the Taurus is Yom Kippur, and the Taurus is Sukkot, three holidays. They're right next to each other in Parchet Emor. It's not like rocket science. So I would say to you, most people don't have Sfarim. And they are going to show up when they come to this pilgrimage festival to see these, this massive statue made out, of, made out of gold, and it's a cow. It's a calf or whatever it is. You know, it's uh, like... So there's a lot of things here that we have to scratch our heads and ask, like, how did this happen? How did the people go down that primrose path? Again, assuming it was idolatry. If it wasn't idolatry, we still have to ask, like, didn't they see something was strange going on in, in, that was going on and unfolding here? Um, by the by, uh, the, the priests, the Kohanim, I use the word priests also advisedly. I would normally call our Kohanim priests because it sounds like another religion, Khalila. But he made Kohanim. They aren't actually Kohanim. They're, he told these people, you're going to be a coin. You're going to be a coin. You, you'll come forward. Are you descended of Aaron a coin? No, no, I, don't, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Just, just come. You want to be involved? Come up. Come up. Be Stand next to me, you know, on the Mizbech, what have you. Uh, Shelly, you had a question. Please, unmute. Go ahead, please. Okay, um, two things. One is um, th there's an asterisk on this contract from Achia Hashiloni, and the asterisk is you have to, um, uh, you have to, do what God tells you to do. You're only being given this. And Achia comes to him in the time of Shlomo. So I've always wondered, what would have happened if Rechavam hadn't done what he did about the uh, taxes? Would, would this have happened? I mean, God knows that it's going to have happened, but it, it, it could have been averted. And the idea that there's this asterisk, you wonder sometimes what's in Yeravam. He starts out as a very smart, pious person. You wonder what's in his mind. I, I'm given this, but I'm only given it temporarily. And he goes, and he goes, and he goes off the rails. Right? Exactly. To your point, he goes completely off the rails. And the question is, was he ever on the rails, or was he like, you know, Machiavellian uh, 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 operator? He's trying to figure out how I could get in. I don't. It's counter, um, counter, uh, into it's, it's it's counterfactual rather for me to play the what if game. You know, like. Let's say that, that Rechavam had not engaged in the folly when the people came to him and said, are you going to you know, tax us as much as your father did? Had he listened to the right voices in his cabinet, we have that, that whole dialogue, right? Who are telling him, you should go soft on them. You should be nice to them. You should tell them things that will be pacifying and don't take a strong hand. Instead, he followed his childhood friends and told them, no, you, you go, you, know, you tell them, you beat them. You know, you tell them my father was a rod, I'll be a scorpion. That's not very good imagery, right? It's terrible. So he went with it. 
I don't know what have, would have happened otherwise. It's true. The Achir Shulani encountered Rav Nevada is earlier. I don't know. Um, but it seems um, it seems that 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 is how it played out, right? That that he went off yours. And, and, and I'm going to ask you when we open now, chapter 13, and we start reading through the Psukim in Parakid Gimel, to ask yourself again and again, what is going through the mind of Yeravim ben Nevat, and especially by the end of the story, what's going through the mind of Yeravim ben Nevat about what does Hashem really want from me now kind of thing. Now, both Karen and Lori typed in questions that are related to each other. Karen asked, how could people be disregarding what's going on in the Torah? It says you have to go to the temple on Sukkot, and you have to be there. And Lori pointed out that all of this makes the people seem so lacking in knowledge, uncommitted to the traditional religious practice. How do we reconcile that? Right, Karen, you wanted to add something to that, please? Yes. To, to me, what it says is that perhaps Yerobam was not instructing the people up there as much as responding to how they were already thinking. It could be. It could be. It very well could be. Um, I'd like to point out that it was only in the days of David HaMelech, of King David, that the place that is referenced in the Torah in chapter 12 in Perak Yudbet of Sefer Dvarim uh, was identified as Yerushalayim. Otherwise, in the Torah, it's actually always called the place. We don't know the place, though. They only know it from the days of David HaMelech. So that's not to the people, to many of the people, that's not centuries old. Helen, give me a minute. I got to finish this point and I'll take a question, comment. Just hold on half a sec. Um, that's not centuries old, right? It's in the lifetime of many of those people. And before that, in living memory, they made uh, Bamot wherever they wanted to, high places wherever they wanted to. I Meaning they would build a, an altar and have it community-based or what have you, right? The Mishkan had already been destroyed earlier. There was no century. There was a place they're offering Korbanot. Yes, it, it was here, it was there, but there was essentially a heter bamot. There was a permission, a license given to do it wherever. So for Yeravam ben Nevat, who holds the cards and the power now, right? And the description, by the by, uh, in Chazal that he puts up, uh, and later people also would put up actual guards to prevent people from crossing over the border to go into the place of Yehuda, means, um, fine, we'll just do it here. Is it ideal? It's not ideal, but Yeravim ben Nevat, no one was at that in encounter with Achia Shiloni, but that was certainly the story everybody knew, right? It was the Lahavdil, it was the, the apple tree story, of right? a certain American presence. Like, that's what people, oh, oh he, but he, he got his Rebbe. Clearly, it's not his Rebbe, but you know, he did this encounter with the great Rebbe of the generation who gave him a bracha. And look, it came true. Now, we helped it come true, the people, but it's true. We don't know also the degree to which the Hamon Am, the masses, know things. We don't. I mean, uh, uh, th th there isn't yet a reality of a printing press. It is not the case that everybody has their own Sefer Torah in their house. Everything has to be handwritten. There are obviously communal centers. We want to believe that many people know a lot of things. But um, I'll tread carefully in the next sentence I'm going to say. But sometimes when Klal Yisrael comes home, finishes their wars, or has a lull in their wars for a period of time, enjoys economic prosperity, does not all live centered around the place of Kedusha of Yerushalayim, but lives on farms and agrarian society spread out, and does not live, did not live during the period, certainly of Shlomo HaMelech, 40-year reign, of being closed off from the world, but rather a very porous border, which includes a lot of cultural influences. Maybe people's religious observance became lax. Maybe they felt a little too at home in the religious sense of it, uh, took off the shoes, they put up their feet in the salon, and they said, you know, it's good to be religious. It's good to be here. But you know, we really did finish the whole script. 
got to Eretz Yisrael, set up a, 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 a kingdom, um, uh, have a powerful army, economic powerhouse, militarily, you know, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, culturally, politically, we're with the talk of the world. We just had 40 years of real prosperity. Yes, there were things that were hard. No, we're not going to keep paying that level of taxes. So we got a new leader. But uh, you want to keep waving the flag of nationalism, which in the case of the Tanakh is not just nationalism. It's always nationalism with spirituality, connection to Hashem, morality, all different, right? Maybe, maybe the people, and how long does it take for the people to go from being, you know, very religious and knowledgeable to being ignorant? I always say the word communism over here, but it doesn't have to just be communism. It could be maybe even a Western country that uh, has, uh, you know, a lot of spiritual and national fervor to it in certain ways, but in other ways has a lot of rank ignorance about religion. I, there's the VM walking around, the prophets. They're not everywhere at all times. Yeah. Karen, you want to say something? And then Helen was waiting as well. So I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, Helen, do you have a comment you wanted to make or a question about this uh, topic that we're talking about right now? I don't hear you. So if you want to unmute, uh, unmute the phone. No? Okay, let me get it. Let me, uh, Helen, I'm going to table what you're going to say because I want to, let me jump in now uh, since all of this was pretty much review and setting the stage for our chapter. So I'd like to get underway with this chapter if it's okay. And we'll take more questions and comments in a few uh, minutes. I just, I must move ahead okay. to open the chapter. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Helen. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I, now you did unmute. Okay, so in a few minutes. Okay. We don't know the name of who this is right now. We're going to find out later, perhaps this person's name, but a man of God, an Ishel Kim, comes from Yehuda. Now it's a separate kingdom. He crossed the border. On the command of Hashem, he comes to Beit El, and Yerovam, the king, is standing on the altar, and he is offering offerings. Who calls out? The Navi calls out in the in the name with the name of Hashem in the name of God. What does he say to the to to the Mizbech? He doesn't talk to Yeravim. He talks to the platform Yeravim standing on. Vayomer Mizbech Mizbech. Call Mar Hashem. He nevein no lad lebeit David. Yoshiyahu Shmo v'zavach alechet ko ane abamot amaktirim alecha v'atzmod adam yisrfu alecha. It's a very hard prophecy to understand. The prophecy says there will be a child born to the house of David. His name is Yoshiyahu, and he will offer upon you the 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 um, the Kohanim, who these uh, priests, so-called priests of these altars, uh, and uh, their bones will be uh, uh, burned upon you. So a lot of questions come up here, but let me keep reading the story a little more. I have to address a ton of questions here. I, he's talking to Mizbeach. He's talking about something that's going to happen. In the future, he gives the name of a future king of Judea. He says what's going to happen. And he gives a sign, a, a mofet, with some kind of a wondrous sign. And what, uh, what is that? The Mizbech will be torn and the ashes that will, will spill out from, from upon it. The Navi has not said a word to Yeruvim ben Nevat, he's talking to an, what seems like an inanimate object. What happens? Yeruvim ben Nevat sees what's going on. He's standing higher up than the prophet, and he stretches out his hand, the hand of the king. Grab him, right? Seize him. His hand becomes frozen, paralyzed. Vativash literally would be desiccated. What does it say in English here? Dried up. Yeah, tivash. Yavesh. It's dried up. It loses its um, its uh, moisture. Means it doesn't. It can't move. It's frozen, solid. It's it's desiccated, fossilized, right there. Right. Um. um so Lahavdol, you see where where uh, Hollywood gets its uh, its scripts from? They look right in the Tanakh. This is how it goes. What happens exactly that moment? The Mizbeach collapses. It's torn. I don't know where the king is standing now. Did he fall down? Is he standing on the last little piece that's standing of the Mizbeach? But it's torn open 
and it falls out. It's torn. It doesn't say it broke, by the way. It's torn. Nikra, with an ayin, means it's torn. And uh, the dashen, the ashes of the Mizbeach, pour out. Exactly. Right? So, uh, a lot of questions. Exactly as was prophesied, that's exactly what happened. Vayan HaMelech, Vayomer, El Isha Elohim, Chal Na, Etnei Hashem Elokech, Vitpalel Ba'adi, Vitashov Yadi Eilai, Vayichal Isha Elohim, Etnei Hashem, Vatashov, Yad HaMelech, Eilav, Vatachich, Kivarishona. What happens? It's almost, you know, it's reminiscent of, um, you know, the signs that were given to Moshe Rabbeinu to stand before Paro, or at least to convince the Jewish people. Remember? As the throw down the staff, it's going to become a snake. You can grab it again, it'll become a staff to show the Jewish people. Before we get to the one in front of Paro, even, even the Jewish people, put your hand under your armpit. When you take it out, it'll be mitzorat. It'll have tzorat, what some people in English translate as a leprosy, right? And you put it back and you come back out again, it'll be fine. But the water become blood. So, so what does the king say? He says, please, right now, beg of Hashem, your God, not my God, your God, let him let him, you know, daven for me. Again, it's ambiguous. Is it your God because it's not my God or is it your God because I know he's your God because he sent you, you know, you're close to him. But daven for me, I'm begging you. You're a holy man, right? Let my hand come back to me. Still standing with the arm outstretched. You can't move it and everything's falling apart around him. And what happens is an entreaty by the Ish Elohim, the man of God. And indeed, his hand comes back and it was as it was before. Now, you would think after this happens, what is your Ben Benavat supposed to do? He's supposed to pack up his bags and go back to Egypt, or better, since he has a lot of people there who have come to the pilgrimage, say to them, my dear friends, tap on the microphone, get everyone's attention and say, we've been terribly mistaken. We can't live this way. The Navi has come from Yehuda to tell us there has to be another way. I'm confused like you're confused because, as you know, right behind me stands the big scroll from Achia Shiloni basically giving me my royal charter. I didn't know that what we were doing was wrong, you know, or I did know, but I'm that was really not a good idea because if my arm could be paralyzed, clearly the rest of me could be paralyzed. I could lose my life. So I don't want to go down that road, right? Because it's personally affected me. And look, the beautiful Mizbeach that I spent all this time building is gone. No one can worship now here. There's a sign in this. We better do tshuva. But no, what happens instead? Come home with me. Let's have a nice yomtif meal, right? I'll give you a gift. Let me give you some tribute. I owe you something for your time. Your religious services were really very helpful and I'd like to pay you for them because clearly you have your price. I give you a nice meal and a gift. God told me three things. Don't eat bread there. Don't drink water there. And don't go back home on the way from which you came. So, Ale. So and so it was. He left. And he did not go through the same path that he came that through which he had come. He takes another route home, uh, back to Beit El. An incredibly strange story, second only to the story that happens afterward. I'm skipping the second story. We had learned it actually many many weeks ago. So some of you already know what's coming. I'm skipping it. Before we read it, we have to read the bookend of this parak. Skip to page um, four hundred and twenty-five. Next page, or for those who are using another Tanakh, chapter 13, the end of the chapter, verse 33. And if you look at verses 33 and 34, you will see that there is a short space between the two sections to show you that this is its own freestanding section. It's like the coda to everything we read in chapter 13. And it's important to read it so that it can color everything we've read until now and color everything we're going to see in that second shocking story with the remaining time. Achar. Hadavar Hazeh Loshav Yerov Am Midarko Hara'a Bayoshav Bayas Miktsot Ha'am Koane Vamot Hechafetz Yamale et Yado Vihi Koane Vamot. After 
all of this, we didn't even read all of it yet, but we read already half of it. What did it do to Yeravam? Nothing, nothing. He went ahead and he got other people, right? You got anyone who wanted to come forward. You want to be a coin? You're a coin, you're a coin, you're a coin, you're a coin. Everybody, whoever wants to be a coin, come join me, right? And he himself, by the way, he's, he's among them. Vayihi badavar hazeh lechatat beit Yeruvam ulahachid ulahashmid me'al pnei adama. This was the great sin of Yeruvam, and it'll be cut off. The house of Yeruvam will eventually, not immediately, but eventually, be cut off. It's a great sin, and they'll be completely destroyed from the face of the earth. End of the parak. Not the end of Yeruvam, but the end of the parak. Which begs the question, I see Shelly's hand is up, and maybe Helen's the one to make her comment, a question about this chapter that we're up to. Clearly there was a message, even in this interchange between the prophet and Yeruvam ben Nevat about what he was supposed to do. And he didn't heed the call. So, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you one, one of them, which is pretty obvious, right? Whose hand withers? Whose hand withers? Uh, Yeruvam's hand. Whose hand withers? When you go to a wedding, whose hand withers? Not the people at the wedding, but it's mentioned. Now, that hasn't been written yet at the time of this story. But just picture the king, the so-called king, some king you know, arm outstretched and suddenly right tottering because he can't control his arm. And it's not that, right? It's like he's paralyzed. It's, it's, it just doesn't move. It doesn't work. Now, I was his right hand, his left hand doesn't exactly say, but the gist of it is his arm is the arm of power. It's the Yara Chazaka. Not anymore. You know why? Because you went off the rails. One, two. What's the man talking to uh, talking to a, an altar for? It's weird, no? So if you look at the Mishnah, I didn't even give it to you in the source. We didn't even open the sources yet. If you look at the Mishnah in Parak uh, Ravi, in Masechet Sukkah, in Daf Mem Ham, page 45, you'll find there that it describes that when the people would leave the on Sukkot, when they would say goodbye to the Mizbeach, they would, so to speak, talk to the Mizbeach. I mean, not that they thought it was animate, but sort of give it a thank you for reasons I won't go into now why that happened, why they would do that. But there was a custom that they would give thanks to God and they would praise the Mizbeach because this was the main avenue of serving Hashem, especially on Sukkot. Why especially on Sukkot? Because you have daily offerings. You have Shabbat offerings, you have Rosh Chodesh offerings, you have holiday offerings on Pesach and Shavuot and Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippurim, but none of them hold a candle to the number of offerings on Sukkot. 70 bulls and all sorts of sheep, and there are so many, hundreds of people are coming. It's, there's more than, ever, than, than any other holiday of that which is being offered on the altar. It comes the Navi, he speaks to the altar, and he says, you are the portal, you think, to Hashem. Now, obviously, it's true, traumatic, right? It's the imagery. No, you're not. And you're not going to be broken, and you're not going to be just uh, sinking into the ground. You're going to be torn. And when you're torn, things will pour out of you. You're going to be torn open and poor, as if it was like a person. As if it was like a heart that is going to be torn. Pour out your heart uh, before God. Right? What's going to spill out? Ashes. And the people are there. There's ashes. I imagine there's a dust cloud from the ashes, the ashes, the ashes. Yeah. And Yeravim doesn't, he doesn't get the message. He didn't get the memo from all of that. His reaction even is, name your price. I'll bring you, I'll bring you to my house. You'll be my guest. And the Navi therefore has this instruction, do not eat in this place because there will be, the, um, the, the scuttlebutt will be that you're part of his retinue, just like everybody else. Right? I, I got here somehow. I got the thing from Achia Shilani standing behind me in some regard. I have all sorts of people. I have the vast, you want to do democracy? Let's be democratic. I have the vast majority of the Jewish people with me. Not with you, not with you. So we have to do a little something that's going to be symbolic at least where not only am I saving face, but you're really with me. Join my party. Tarte mashma, double entendre, join my party. And what does the Navi say? I can't eat and I won't drink 
And I'm not even going back the way I came. You know what? If I go back the path when I came, maybe I'm going home with my tail between my legs. I saw one of the articles I was reading. is a beautiful uh, 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 shear by uh, Rabbi Alex Israel. He has his own ideas. I'm not sure I agree with all of them, but he quoted from um, uh, Professor Uriel Simon, who said that the idea of retracing your steps is to go backwards in your quest, to like revert what you did. Therefore, taking another road home showed I'm going back where I came from, but I'm not, I'm not retracing my steps. I'm showing I meant what I said. Now, we didn't read the second shocking story. We didn't open it yet, which I don't want to address right now. So don't ask me questions about that second story and give away what's coming if you already read ahead. Um, as Karen pointed out in writing over here, by the rivers of Babylon, exactly, right? Isn't this in a certain way the first exile from Yerushalayim? Again, but it has a prophet who said it was supposed to happen. Well, isn't the exile to Bavel also a prophet who said it was going to happen? Again, I said anachronistically, those lines hadn't been written yet. But the say, the concept is here first. Give me my hand back. Okay, fine. Woo. Well, that was that was bad. So do you want to come over for lunch? What do you mean you want to come over for lunch? How about change your ways? How about fix it? How about you cannot be here claiming you're a coin, you're a coin, you're a coin. Let's set up, let's just make another Mizbech. By the way, they end up making another Mizbech after this. It's not like they said, well, is there, is there a memo here? No, it's worked out. Everything's good. Now, why did they think that? What happened that gave them sort of ammunition on the other side of the ledger to think to themselves, mm, we, can, we can keep going? That is the second story we didn't get to yet. Shelly, you had a question, comment, and then Helen, and then uh, we'll move uh, forward. Go ahead, Shelly, go ahead, please. <laughs> This reminds me of what's going to happen later on with Eliyahu and the prophets of Baal. Yeah. And we know that the people say at that point, Hashem, who Elohim? Yes. Uh, oh, I lost you at the, at the most important moment. Say again. I lost you. You said Hashem, who Elohim, and then we lost the sound on, on your what you were saying. Shelly? Not so much? Okay. Uh, and Say it again. I, we, I got you again. Okay, repeat. Okay. Um, where are the people in this? We 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 got in the Eliyahu story. The people say Hashem who Elohim. If this is a big holiday, and and he's uh, Yeravam is doing this in front of all the people to show you know showcase his holiday. Where are the people? Why aren't they saying anything? Well, well, you know, it it's it's very hard. I mean, this is yeah. this is so obvious. We're going to have to get there when we get to the Eliyahu story to try to answer that question. But as was pointed out, you know, the question was coming up before also, like the people didn't stand up en masse and say, this is wrong. We can't do this. You made a second uh, and a third religious worship center. Didn't we hear again and again from the kings, the prophets, there's going to be one place and now it was chosen. Well, how did it get unchosen? So we had talked about this in depth. I don't know to go down that whole road about some of the issues. <laughs> How many years is this? This isn't, how many years in his reign is this? There have to be plenty of people that were around in Shlomo's reign. It's hard. When we go back to Ezra and Nehemiah and they rebuilt the second temple, there are people who are crying because they can't, they remember the first temple and this isn't the same thing. So there have to be plenty of people. There's a tribe of Yazachar that's supposed to be the scholars. Right. What is going on? Question's better than the answer. What I'm trying to explain is that you know, uh, 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 it seems it was not as solidified as people, as you would imagine, that that was going to be the center, right? Because you don't have the rebellion of the people saying, well, we're not going to make a separate worship center, right? <clears throat> and I do think it's bound up with the fact that there was a sort of a Pax Judaica, at least internally, I'm not saying they were conquering the whole world, but where people, there was a certain religious lassitude that came about precisely because of prosperity. Exactly as the Torah warned, by the way. Exactly as the Torah warned, right? That it won't be, it won't be long. You're gonna, you're gonna be settling in, and everything's gonna be good, and uh, you'll forget. It's not a, it's not a crime of commission at the beginning. You know, we're gonna run because we love idolatry. Ah, we'll do a little Shabbos here. We'll eat a little kosher food there. You want me to keep making the trek all the way to Shalai? And now it's even a different country. Like, let's just do something here. Let's just make a small thing over here. You know, I don't want to keep going to Hakafot, you know, for, with a million people. Uh, we'll do a small something. Give, give me, give, give it to me. Cause I, I just, it's the same God. I'm not worshiping idols, God forbid, you know, except for the people who were, so they would say that it was. Yeah. So all these things are true. That's correct. 
And and but just to do the timeline, this is in the beginning of Yeravim ben Avat's reign. Rechavam did not reign at all, at all, the entire country, maybe for like a few weeks or something, right? Shlomo Melech, uh, what is it, 40 years? David Melech, 40 years. So there are people who are alive in the time of David, the older people who are still alive now, right? Was their voice muted? Did they not care? Did they have their issues with David? Certainly did. And then Shlomo came along. Did some of them have issues with Shlomo? Sounds like a lot of them did, because but they never voiced it. And then Rechavim came along, you know, came up. Yeah, these, this is a very serious uh, 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 issue, for sure. And they have a very beautiful, ornate temple standing in Jerusalem, but you want to schlep all the way to Yerushalayim, like, where are we going to get parking, you know? You know, it's, 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 it's a schlep. We can't keep, keep doing that. And now we have an out. And it may be even religiously sanctioned, except for this story where a prophet shows up and, you know, quite literally has the, the, has the, the altar, you know, breaking open and shedding ashes, you know, the broken heart. You know, that's your vehicle for serving Hashem. Boom, I t- it's going to be torn. And where's your king? He can't even move his arm until I daven so Hashem will give him back control of his arm. Yeah? Helen, you still want to say something? I'm sorry. I kept you on the street yeah, for so long. Okay, Wait, no, go ahead. No problem. Unfortunately, remarks pale after all this, but I'll go ahead with the first one uh, is more current, that the prophet is saying, if I go with him, shtika kohodoya, and come into my parlor to the spider to the fly. Very good. Back, exactly back what it is. To our sto- back to our story. Salenu al tafenu hezenu bikurim. So in regard to the Sholos Regalim, there's a lot of preparation and tithing and this and that, that the average Zahor is in, in, involved on his part to bring to the temple. It's it's a two-way, he's got to get rid of this extra Bikurim. And it's told so many times, different than Yom Amorayim, because you're not involved in bringing anything. So it's a little different than yeah. being in that involvement. Yeah, it could then, be they were bringing something. I don't, I, we don't really know. And then regarding the place, Go Ren Arnon. We just got finished mentioning that, that we do know the place, that this is the Go Ren Arnon that the Beis Hamikdash will be at. That's in Shmuel it's Bet. That's like in the Book of Samuel too, at the end. Oh, 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 because we just went through it on Yontif that we said that. Yeah, but that's a lot. Yeah, that we mentioned it right in Hoshana, but that's that's in the Tanakh. That's that's um. You know, more than eighty years ago, earlier, it's not just. Oh, so there is there, and what about the Jebusites and the and the contract? right? So all that we covered in in the book of Shmuel Shmuel Beth. I don't want to go back there now because oh, so we nobody, don't have time. Yeah, but so nobody at, at at this moment, nobody knows. They all so know. David, how, they all David know. They don't care. Band. They all know, but there is doubts. They all know, but they also have a prophet who came along and said. Uh, to a person who was not of the Davidic line, you're about to be in charge of 10 tribes. And as Shelley pointed out, there's a conditions involved, you know, in terms of what you have to do, in terms of your own behavior, your own responsibility, but, you know, you're getting the charge. So I got, it's confusing. Okay, one, one other, one other point that I left you a message. Re, no remorse. Oh, you did. Yeah, you did leave me that. But Helen, I'm going to cut you off there because those three people that you mentioned, which is an important thing we should talk about offline, maybe on Shabbos at the kids we talk about, because it's not really, it's not this story. It's not, it's not. No, no, but I'm saying it's the fourth one. Shlomo HaMelech is guilty of the same attitude. There is no remorse as he's descending down. And this could be why his children, because David is so important in Oshan Nubogadi. And so Shlo- Shlomo HaMelech did not give that message to his children. Right. Uh, I, we talked a lot about Shlomo and the, you know his decline and the issues, yeah. challenges there. And where's the tshuva there? We did, we talked about like two shiurim on it. So I don't want to open it up. Your point is well right. taken. I don't have a good answer. Um, okay. But uh, you okay. did jog, jog my mind about one thing about the fact that when the Navi speaks specifically to Yeravim, to the Mizbeach, 
in front of Yerav ben Avad. It's really Yerav Mu here, obviously. In Pasuk Gimel, it actually uses the expression that the Mizbech will be torn, which I see as anthropomorphic imagery. It's like the, you know, the like a heart that will be torn, a body will be torn. But it jogged my memory to also, I'm sorry to point this out, that in chapter 11, Wait. in chapter oh, 11, yeah. if you look at verse 30, chapter 11, verse 30, Perak Yud Aleph Pasuk Lamed, right? It says that Achia, in order to make his point prophetically to Yerav ben Nevat, what does it describe? He tore it into 12 strips. He took the new garment and he tore it into 12 strips. Take 10 of those torn strips. I'm tearing it. Now the Mizbech is getting torn. It's the same, the same verb. Now how much Yerav is thinking about that prophecy? Well, that was a Chiyashul giving him the whole charter. So maybe he did think about the imagery of tearing and now it got, so to speak, torn, broken open, etc. cetera. Um, one more thing, one more please. thing. What did the brothers tell Yaakov about the Ksonas Pasim when they bring it, that the lion tore him? No, uh, no it doesn't use the same word though. It's to, that's to, 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 Taraf word. Taraf. That's tet, oh, okay. uh, that, that's tet Resh Pei. This is Kuf oh, okay. Resh and I don't remember that language being used there, but um, yeah, okay. I just don't remember that, that language being used there per se. But um, but uh, we had talked about in chapter 11 about the coat being torn and the coat of many colors and the strips and the pathema stripes. We talked about that in chapter 11, but now we're, we're up to 13. So I'm going to I'm going to bring us okay. uh, bring us back okay. right here. If that's OK. Let me continue a little bit more with the sheer. We have um, if it's OK, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on you look at it, I have. Um, uh, I have um, just a few minutes left because I, I, today I got I got to stop ten thirty. Believe it or not, uh, on the dot. So we're never we're not getting to the Makora to have five, four pages that I handed out here. It'll be for next week. You'll see it inside. Lori pointed out that this evoked the imagery of tearing the cloak, the son of the Malchut. Yes, again, chapter eleven, Ayin Sham, the tearing of the Malchut, the tearing away of the cloak of Shaul. Now the tearing of the cloak of the Salma. We talked about Salma Shlomo. We did this whole thing. Ayin Sham, there's a sheer online. You could listen, uh, you know, in uh, in color and in stereo, as they say. Listen to stereo and see it in color. Um, I mean, we're going to read the, the the next story. We're not going to be able to plumb the depths of it. Uh, you, it's a shocking, horrific story. But again, think about the bookend, that there was supposed to be a message for Yerav and Ben Nevat. Just from reading the first part of the story, we get, oh, we got the story. The story is... How come he didn't get the memo? That's the big sin. Is that right after he heard all of that? What was the net result? Let me appoint some more Kohanim. Let me uh, let me keep going. And as Helen said very accurately, no remorse, no rethinking of things, no recalibration, no tshuva, no tshuva, no tshuva. Um, uh, and um, there is there is something uh, something to consider about what does it mean that that uh, you're of him now had the direct warning. At least some aspect of his um, of his decision making was flawed, and, and more than flawed, it was an egregious violation of what Hakadosh Baruch Hu wanted. That there should be a place in Yerushalayim, people should come. I how you can reconcile that with the reality that he was a king and now another country where the people are supposed to go over the border every time. I don't know. Counterfactual. I don't know. And that's what Yerav Menavat must be asking himself. But he's especially asking himself that question ten times because of what happens next. Pasuk Yud Aleph. This story is set is story two, which is not directly involving Yerav and Menavat, but for sure Yerav and Menavat and everyone else heard about this story, and may explain why Yerav and Menavat didn't do tshuva. But it's going to leave us with a slew of questions, which we won't answer today. But that'll be a cliffhanger. You have to come back next week. It'll draw you back hopefully for next Thursday at nine thirty. So a boy comes home to tell his father, who is an elder, who lives in Beit El, who is a prophet, who lives in Beit El. And he tells him what happened, because the story was, of course, going around. It was being spread everywhere. Which way did he go? I, I, let's 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 sh I'll show you right. So vayomer el banav chivshuli achamor vayach vayach besulo achamor vayirkavalav 
He gets his donkey together, a whole pasuk to tell us about getting the donkey saddled, evocative of earlier stories in Tanakh, where a person saddles a donkey, Abraham, Moshe, there's something, right, that's going on here. He goes and he finds him sitting under a, an Ela tree, one of these, an oak tree of a sort. Are you the man of God who came from Yehuda? He says, yes, I am. Come to my house and eat. I'm sorry, I just, I, I just can't do that. Reminding us that he just told the king that he couldn't go to his house either. I was told he can't. By Hashem. I'm also a Navi. In one Pasuk, we learn the following information. I'm also a prophet. I am, I, an angel came to tell me in the name of Hashem that you should come to my house and you should eat and you should drink there. And he lied. And he lied. The prophet lied. It's in the Pasuk. Kicheshlo means he lied, which is shocking. Can't answer the questions. I'm leaving all the questions open now. He agrees. He acquiesces, goes to the house. See the little pause? In that pause is the sound of chewing and swallowing. The sitting and the eating. And while they're sitting there at the table, the word comes not to the man of God who just spoke to Yerav Benavat or to the to Yerav Benavat through the, the, the altar, but rather to this man who a moment ago told you he lied. Now Hashem actually did send him in real, real prophecy. Since you uh, rebelled against the word of God, since you didn't keep the mitzvah that Hashem your God commanded you, since you came and you did come back and you sat, you ate and you drank exactly where you were told not to do so. You will not be buried with your, uh, with your, your forefathers. That's your punishment. You'll not be buried with your forefathers. I mean, what? But how could that be? It's impossible. And yet that is exactly, uh, exactly what happened. Um, and um, it's 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 hard to really understand what this means. So I'll read two more psukim, and then we have to say goodbye for today. And it is going to be a cliffhanger with tons of questions. So you got to come back next week, hear how it goes, and we'll learn some sources inside on the screen and, and, and on paper as well. And everyone's invited to come back in person. By the way, we got lots of room. We're just a few of us right here. So after he ate and he drank, so he gets his donkey saddled by the host. He leaves to go home. A lion shows up and kills him. And his carcass is on the side of the road, right there on the edge of the road. And the donkey that he was on is standing right there. And you know who's not doing anything, just hanging out? The lion. The lion standing next to the carcass of the of the person that he just killed, and he is standing next to the donkey, not eating either of them. Yeah, shocking. You're of and Benavat. You invited the man home. He didn't come with you. What's the next thing you hear? He was eaten by a lion. Where is he? Sitting on the side of the road. You know why? Uh, maybe, maybe it wasn't really a prophecy. Maybe, you know, a lot of false prophets out there. We can't believe everything we hear. How did he get me to paralyze my arm? I don't know. Coincidence, you know? I, I think there's a history of that in my family if I look up the medical chart. I, I don't know. The Mizbeach broke open? It's a magician. He can do things. You know, there's a lot of black magic out there. I don't have to listen to this. How do I know? Because he's dead. Because he didn't make it back home. And he wasn't killed by a person who has free will, so to speak. He's killed by a lion. And you know what the lion is supposed to do now? Eat him. 
or at least eat the, eat the donkey. But the lion's just standing there. You know why it's standing there? To remind us all that Hashem sent it. And the lion, of course, is symbolic of a particular tribe. Remember? It's in the Torah. It's in the Torah. It's not just today that you go in Yerushalayim and you see it on the, on the manhole cover, you know, or the whatever. Yeah. The flag, but it, but right? It's going to mean something. It's a lion. The lion yeah, should... so Exactly. And what is the lion doing? Nothing. The lion is doing the killing. Because you don't really represent the name of Hashem, the word of Hashem. That's the message. And do you know who's the real prophet and the fake prophet? Well, you know, and I know, because written in a Navi about a lying prophet and a truth-telling prophet. But when you're Yeravim ben Avat, eh, what was the end of that fellow? I even invited him home and he didn't come to my house. But you know where he is now? His carcass can be found on the highway, whatever it is over there, on Kvish Tishim. He's, uh, he's lying dead. Anyway, I got to stop right now. We're over time. We're going to pick it up next week where we'll learn in depth, try to understand what is going on. But you understand just hearing these two episodes, and we didn't finish this episode. There's more. There's a lot more. You know, why and what happened here? And Yerovim ben Avat now, you know, was told you're totally off the rails. Anyway, let's go to next week, God willing. And we'll see you, God willing, Monday this year in Chumash, 9.15, and next Thursday, 9.30. See you then. Be well.